so um, we're more or less done with like concepts in this class, except tomorrow we'll do a bit of simulation, all of that. So we want to just look at a few projects and uh, sort of talk a little bit about uh, what is happening on these projects and based on what we've learned recently, is there something that we can do about them, right? So the two projects that we want to talk about are uh, today will be the Delhi airport uh, and the Tirupur uh, water supply. So we'll start with the Delhi airport. So group one, one of you come and present, uh, just tell us about the Delhi airport and then we'll discuss a bit. Uh, I'll be re representing group one and I'll discuss on Delhi international airport. So first, I'll go through how what's the history during 1990s in India. Uh, because of some liberalization forms, the growth in GDP growth uh, like went up to seven percent. In order to maintain that, our government has like constant effort, like constant need to maintain some uh, maintain the GDP. So they thought transportation infrastructure like they had more uh, scope on transportation infrastructure. So in 1998, uh, government of India. Uh, formed a task force for the development of in transportation infrastructure, uh, mainly for the transportation infrastructure. So the Prime Minister then announced it for the identification of five uh, five places, five cities for uh, construction of airports. With like because they don't have so so much funding, they thought with possible private sector involvement and hundred percent foreign investment. And so this task force was main aim is to identify these places and they identified New Delhi based on the air traffic at the time it was like around 21 percent or something. So they thought New Delhi was good to create this world class airport. Uh, it was also most profitable airport. Then the Ministry of Civil Aviation Department MOCA uh, prior to this. Uh, a sorry, that was AAI was formed. That was merging both national and international airport authorities were merged and formed AIA. And now the MOCA swung like it came into the action for how the project should be implemented and all. Uh, so the project, how the project went on is uh, they thought of many options such as like corporatization of entire uh, like entire AIA or the uh, discussion is still going on. But they like ruled out the op option because uh, there is no proper regulatory framework or legal framework for the uh, like for complete corporatization. They even ruled out entire airport giving it because uh, the government was much more interested in the projects and the profits in involved in it. So the thought uh, long time long term lease option might be a better option. And since at that time even the private sector participation is much. Uh, much more present in road sector, but not in aviations. So government doesn't have that good idea on how the how it works. So they approached KPMG. It's a consultant company. So uh, they recommended like for 30 year lease period with private sector involvement. By January 2003, uh, and though uh, the AIA and government of India they were like much interested in how the project will go on. So they thought. They want involvement in the project. Then the Supreme Court gave a rule that uh, like approved use of private-led joint venture company. So like they thought of forming a joint JVC uh, with shareholding by AA and GOA both for like a long time for a long-term lease provider. And in the same like within nine months, when this bill was passed, will bill the, when this bill was accepted. Like within nine, like ten months, again in November, New Delhi won the bid for to for the implement like to host Commonwealth Games, like which is much more needed for the completion of project much earlier. So this was the development phase of the project. The first it can like um, some EMOG was formed uh, for the how the process should be taken care of, and they thought first selection of consultants was done. Uh, firstly, they they some prioritized based on technical scores and some prioritized on financial scores. But there was a clash, so again they called for a fresh bid, which is like on a limited basis. The only the top three or someone, only those three bids were called, and based on their uh, technical presentations, uh, the the winner was announced, and the bid score was like seventy five percent for technical and twenty five percent for presentation. And after the bidding was done, like they even mentioned that 
winner should be asked to match the price set by the AA. If they are quoting higher, they should reduce it to the price set by them. The final, the total advisors are like for global technical advisors, legal advisors, accounting and tax advisors. So uh, next the process is, once the consultants were selected, the next process is development. Next phase is development. So the consultants came up with this model concession agreements, which included uh, like most of them. And th this was uh, sent through the cabinet for approval. And then many objections came and many issues came up with this uh, concession agreement. And finally, they thought, the pro they came up with one certain rule set, project for the uh, development should be done on a open tender basis with pre-qualification of bidders and a request for proposal and uh, part of bidding process should be approved by cabinet prior to being released and some other uh, prerequisites were mentioned by the consultants and after the selection of bidder, a winner would form a, like as mentioned before, they would form a joint venture company with AIA with through shareholders agreement and once they win they'll be given the uh, they'll be given for uh, development and operations and management of airport they'll be handed over so this is how the bid process went initially an invitation was sent to to express interest there or to register interest but during that time it was like late slightly ex extended due to elections and the newly formed government made some changes the newly formed government cha made changes so that um, it reduced um, it reduced cap for foreign investment, but uh, raised cap for equity participation from Indian domestic lines itself. So even though out of all this, uh, ten bidders showed interest, of which um, of which nine were qualified for the next stage. Uh, during that time, Mumbai Airport modernization was also uh, like uh, came into uh, like came into existence. So they thought maybe the combined bidding might reduce the cost, and combined bidding was done. Scores were given to each bidders based on like there were technical criteria, financial criteria. Uh, technical criteria they included some two main uh, criteria, but scores were given to all 58 criteria. And like they thought of some 58 sub criteria and score were evaluated for each thing and they put the cutoff as like 80 percent. So this resulted in two major bits, uh, two major companies uh, with more than 80 percent cut, cut off. Uh, in order to, next the revaluation was done, the government proposed like GR, they formed GRC in order to check how this is going on. So then GRC raised concern that um, the scores were not subject, was mostly subjective and they didn't include IMG which was formed earlier. So they thought maybe they'll, they thought they consulted some GETE, another, cons another like engineers group of engineers which are highly qualified. Uh, they again evaluated and finally after evaluations, the, the only one, the previously which were like two bidders which were more than 80 percent, one was reduced to like 70 or something and the other one was more than 80. So only one bidder was left for both airports. Uh, so what happened is final award, they thought they reduced the cutoffs and GM, the top the top one was GMR and it was given the choice to choose and select, like it can either choose Mumbai or Delhi and it selected Delhi. Uh, so and the guard, many were many petitioned in the court that they they were not even aware of the cutoffs, so they might be better. And so uh, the Supreme Court came up with, um, they should, the GMR should match the next finan best financial bid submitted by other qualified bidders for, for uh, Delhi airport. And so the next was, I think, Reliance the highest. So they were supposed, the GMR, G, the GMR was supposed to agree on Revenue share to revenue share up to 49, 45.99 percent, and then they formed DIL. It was devil some. I don't remember the exact. Then. And then comes the agreement, concession agreement. This is the, like just an overview, and I'll go in deep. The first one is operation man, operations management and development agreement. The concession agreement con, con, like consisted many. This was one. In this, they mainly 
focused on equity sharing ratios between JVC, A, and like whatever other GOA entities which are present there. And they assigned responsibilities for each. And it also included the duration of concession, which should be, which is initially fixed at 30 years, but can be extendable based on the based on the requirements to another 30 years. And transfer of human resources, which was that they should um, they should employ all the existing employees for three years, and later, which the employees can either choose or retire, or it's based on their wish. And tariff setting mechanism for aeronautical revenues. This was for tariff increase in future, it was based on a formula, CPIX formula. They, uh, they took into account the total asset base of airport and tra total traffic volumes. It included both. And after that, transfer of assets upon expiry of tenure, like there will be both non-aeronautical assets and non-aeronautical assets. So they uh, thought how the both assets will be transferred to AIA. And the other word, performance standards, uh, these performance standards, like for each objective performance, is like um, how the perf uh, airport is performing in some situations, and like subject to means how the survey, the there was a survey based on how easy is it to calculate uh, to locate uh, some air like sorry finding ways through airport and all that such things are. And there was minimum cutoff on subject to performance measures. Similarly, quality to quality management certification, they want JVC to get a ISO standard certificate. And infrastructure development standards, so it's, these are all some performance standards. In case the uh, it is uh, it's uh, unable to meet those criteria as mentioned before, they should give a penalty of 2.5 months until it is rectified. And the fee structure was the like 150 crores initial payment and along with as mentioned before 45.99% per, revenue share to the AAA mm, and step in rights in case of any emergency their AAA or government of India they thought even of about the emergency issues and the other agreements include shareholders agreement uh, this was that uh, JVC will be majority like three fourths majority, and they can take decisions, but corporate decisions. But in case of any terms of change in terms of equity or business of JVC, a change in business of JVC or anything, such things should be uh, like all the uh, these things should have uh, votings from all the AI people. But majority decisions for like those can be taken by JVC. And there was other thing called lease deed agreement. This was between JVC and AI like for the exist uh, airport premises for uh, uh, 2DIL and, and there is like state support agreement, state government support agency and these are others. And so the, other, the final thing is construction time performance. The project was completed within the timeline and with much faster pace. The, there were many complexities in the project while uh, uh, the JVC had thought of. So he approached Prime Minister and he formed the Prime Minister formed this NFC, National Facilitation Committee, which has representatives from all the stakeho stakeholders which are concerned with the project. So the JVC would up, uh, raise any issues, it, it came up and then they will be solved in the project itself. Um, the consult, the cons contractors used earn value technique in order to mon monitor project progress. And the cost performance, initially they claimed that uh, it will be something and but later they thought, they said it will be 40% more than that. It's because of creation of new air traffic control. In order to maintain these, uh, like recoup these additional expenses, they thought, a thought they will levy a de development fee for four years, but there were again issues with it. So Delhi high government issued that it should be implemented in two stages. There were many, uh, criticism on them, like there are many concerns regarding CAG on DAL, but DAL answered almost all. They said that it received for six, uh, like it received DAL received airport for sixty years, and with like the lease period in the lease entire area throw away price at only hundred per annum, and some concerns were raised by the CAG. Uh, like despite all this, the Transition 
uh, the in the airport itself there were many existing manually operated terminals were changed to newly high built which were not aware like they are not aware of how they were be uh, would be performed so there initially they need some training to be done for those people uh, there were losses for the jvc in the initial years but then they exploited real estate and they finally have claims to have broke even on its operational expenses they even received second rank among similar sized airports by 2012 the key learnings include that early bid was like slant, uh, likely likely slant, uh, lengthy and it needs to be properly discussed well in prior and the bid process was iterative due to considering maybe uh, mumbai and delhi airports at a time maybe they could be done uh, like not at a time but uh, consecutively and it even set a good example of by forming nfc we can see that how all the stakeholders could manage on how the project should like all the concerns regarding it and i think those are main key learnings like the final project included final complex project included that like there will be many stakeholders and government agencies over time which are which need the which scrutiny the complex projects Okay, thanks, uh, Yamini and Group One, for a very detailed presentation of all the um, um, actions that happened. Let me see if I can find this there. What I want to do is I'm just going to add on one more slide to your PowerPoint. Okay, and uh, so what I want to now talk about is we have this case, right? There's a lot of information. Let's first talk about the kinds of challenges that this case faced, and then we'll talk about potential tools that we've talked about in class that we could use. So, what are some of the challenges that this project faced. So, type of PPP was itself a bit of a challenge, right? It was not easy to figure out what kind of PPP uh, to undertake. They took a long time to figure out should it be joint venture, should it be a lease, should it be a PPP and of course, this was quite early on in the process, right? So, that took a little bit of time, okay? Great. What else? Um, okay, but what is the issue that too many stakeholders created? There's too many stakeholders everywhere. So, but what was the, I mean, the question is when you say too many stakeholders, where, right? During the shaping phase, during tendering, construction, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Okay. Yeah, too many stakeholders in construction. Okay, and these are essentially a number of organizations that need to give permission. Um, you know, the local municipality, maybe the electricity department, of course, the contractors, the subcontractors, uh, possibly labor unions, etc. All of these sort of groups, okay. So, that was a big challenge that needed to be negotiated, okay. What other challenges? Okay, the bidding itself, right, was a, was a huge challenge, okay. And there were again two parts to this. One is they had to, you know, do these retenders. Okay, which are always a bit, uh, you know, irritating in the sense they said, look, uh, so they have, they, they've given out a set of criteria, they've put out an evaluation mechanism, bids have come in, they've evaluated and then there is a committee that comes up and says, hey, wait a second, we need to reevaluate. let's take six of these parameters, they're too subjective, let's make them objective, right. So, it's almost as if you're turning things around after you've made a selection and indeed, I think there was at least one candidate who in the original regime had been selected. But when this new committee came in and rejigged the evaluations, they uh, fell off the radar, right? And so that the transparency in the bidding process is something that we need to think about. Also, when selecting consultants, also they had a little bit of retent. Then they also had um, uh, so the one was retendering. The second one was, of course, the court case, right? As the end of the bidding process, because the we decided. Uh, you know, of course, Yamani pointed out we were trying to modernize our aviation infrastructure. It made a lot of sense to modernize Delhi and Bombay. Delhi is, of course, the capital of India. You want to come in uh, to the country, to the capital, you expect to see a nice, uh, big sort of modernized airport. Bombay is the financial capital of the country. There are probably more people coming into Bombay than any other city. So, again, you want uh, Bombay to actually make a good impression on people. So, Delhi and Bombay, no brainer, there are lots of flights, etc. So, you decided to modernize the two, but you decided to modernize the two simultaneously, right? And you ran a simultaneous bidding process for both, right? The problem with that was you were not sure if uh, a single entity could do both at the same time. So, you also put in a clause saying uh, both of these cannot be performed by the same person, right? You do not want to put all your eggs in one basket, 
okay which is again again yamini was pointing out maybe you should have then staggered it right do one first and then the other because in this case the worst fears came true right in the sense gmr led consortia were winning bidders in both cases right and therefore the second rule kicked in saying look we can't have the same person building bombay and delhi because you know we don't know if you have the capability to build one airport let alone two and if something goes happen you go bust both airports uh, <coughs> right are at peril and therefore we need to have uh, you know different stakeholders i mean different companies building both airports but because gmr had won both the polite thing to do was to go to gmr and say okay you can only take one of these which one would you like to take okay and gmr looked at delhi and the ad other advantage with delhi was there were also land development rights associated with the project so you had the airport you also were able to develop land develop airport i mean hotels etc if you guys have been to delhi airport recently and have uh, you know gone out into the city you will see all kinds of uh, you know large hotels all of that which is part of the ppp deal so gmr clearly found delhi to be more lucrative so they said we'll take delhi right fine we'll give out bombay right and bombay therefore went to the gvk led consortium right but of course the person who's number 2 on delhi is upset see the person who's number 2 on bombay is lucky right they now got bumped up to number 1 okay but the person who's number 2 in delhi is now unlucky right had gmr chosen bombay these guys would have been bumped up to number 1 in delhi right and who was number 2 in delhi right it was reliance led consortium right so these guys went to court and say this is ridiculous right i mean this is how can you randomly ask these guys to pick up one this thing why is gvk getting the benefit of the bombay port so lots of sort of questions um, you know are being raised and so the court looked at it and said look gmr won right so therefore we'll have to give it to them but the bidding parameters were obviously a combination of uh, the, uh, the technical sort of specifications your technical qualifications and there was this component of revenue share right which was finally how i select people is a combination of the amount of revenue you will share with me as well as your technical competence etc put together gmr score was above 80 on whatever scoring mechanism that they had right and they had promised i believe you know if i recall correctly just a shade under 40% as revenue share which means of the revenues that they'll get 40% will go back to the airports authority 60% they'll keep and that's how they'll make their money uh, on the airport so the court said that's fine um right but reliance is bid 45% which means reliance is saying for every 100 rupees they'll give 45 rupees to ai right so isn't that a better deal so gmr you can keep the airport but you've got to give us what reliance was giving us right because otherwise right why are we giving it to you for 40 rupees when reliance is giving me 45 rupees okay and so gmr had no option they went in and said fine you know we'll do it at 45 okay so that that was the whole court case that sort of happened with regards to bidding as yamini points out it could have been avoided if you had possibly staggered the development just do one airport at a time so there is no dispute as to who is winning right as per your criteria this per person has won let them uh, sort of take it now the problem with doing it this way is that see gmr has done a detailed calculation and therefore they have arrived at a 40% revenue share right it's a competitive environment they know that they are bidding against other people so if they could have offered 45% what would they have done if according to their calculations 45% was possible what would they have done no no so in the initial bidding right if 45% were possible would gmr have bid 45% revenue share or not okay your gmr okay your spreadsheet tells you that you can actually pay 45% to the government would you say 45% or not you would right because you are competing against others you want to give the sweetest deal possible right so the reason they are saying 40% is probably because as per their calculations 40% is all is the best that they can afford to give right remember it's a competitive scenario there's no point trying to be greedy right i can bid for 10% also i'll never get the project right i need to bid at what is on the margin of possibility right so you've got a bidder who has bid 40% after careful thought now if you force that bidder to do 45% revenue share you are probably taking a risk on the financial sustainability of that bidder right because they're now having to pay you 5 rupees more for every 100 rupees than they had planned and that 5 rupees is coming from money that they had allocated for repaying loans paying dividends to shareholders etc <coughs> right so there's already trouble brewing here okay good what are the other <coughs> challenges in this case 5 rupees may no no the 5 rupees would not have affected the project cost 5 rupees is a revenue share right i have to pay you 5% more revenue share than i expected if i don't make any revenue it doesn't matter whether i promised you 40% or 60% or 90% right 
right it's just a revenue share okay so it doesn't affect the costs right the cost of construction but Srilata yeah so scope changes right so you guys are saying so scope changes came in okay so at some point there was a proposal for a new runway and an air traffic uh, control tower. Now, this is a normal construction contract this is not a problem I want 1000 crores more of work to be done pay me 1000 crores I will do it for you right but this is a PPP I have calculated I have promised I have calculated 30 years of revenue right I have worked backwards to find a minimum profitability for me and I have promised you 40 you have upped it to 45 okay now you want me to do 1000 extra crores of construction right as it is I am bleeding right because you have taken me from 40 to 45 right and you want me to do 1000 extra crores of construction okay so which means there needs to be an alternative revenue stream available right so what do they do for an alternative how do they how do they come up with a scheme where the developer gets back the extra investment so you levy a fee that is the UDF or whatever right the, the, the you know the user fee that you live. So you tell these guys look okay fine right you spend another 1000 crores you want to get those 1000 crores back or whatever number it is right let us start levying a fee on uh, the users right. So pay let them pay a little bit extra to go through Delhi that money accrues to you and whatever. Now this then incurs the wrath of okay who is now upset about this right well reliance is now out of the picture uh, right <coughs> uh, although reliance also you know reliance is not completely out of the picture because reliance now comes up and says because if you had told me this was a possibility I would have bid different uh, right but at the same time the airport uh, era the regulator for the airports as well as the CAG etc are sort of saying what is this right I mean this is not fair uh, you know procurement right you are bringing these guys in at one price point telling them to do something and then you are just artificially increasing this now had you bid originally with two runways and an air traffic control tower and UDF how do you know that you might not have gotten somebody else with a much more competitive bid right. So the scope changes spiral into a number of discussions right how do I get the money back okay levy some extra charges if I levy extra charges others come in and say look what is how is this fair right how after you finish the bid can you say there is a possibility of levying other charges had I known that ahead of time I might have also bid differently right so there are some challenges here okay. Um, any other challenges? Okay. Okay. Short duration. Yeah. So you needed to get it ready for the Commonwealth Games. So that's a bit of a gun held across your head, right? So I think we've covered the main challenges here. What are the strategies that you think could have been used or were used to combat these kinds of challenges? Yeah. So here for the short duration, they used. Uh, we haven't really talked about this much in this class, uh, but most of you have taken either my class on estimation construction management or probably the graduate construction planning and control class. So they did a good job of doing the construction planning well. So earned value techniques and all of that were used um, right. So that that helped there okay. Ah, so that the and this is for they had the national facilitation committee right. So essentially a committee convened under the auspices of the prime minister meets with a viewpoint that any issues you resolve it then and there. Right, so I need to sort of uh, you know dig up something, but uh, electricity board is not giving me permission to dig up, dig up the electricity lines. Resolve it right then and there. Right, figure out how what the plan is for diverting the electrical utilities. Give permission. Make sure that the work gets sticking. Because otherwise, if you start writing letters here and there, there is no end to it. So national facilitation committee was was an important part. Right, what so these are the two strategies very clearly visible. Okay, what else could have been done? right so contract flexibility I think is key here right we have talked about this in class and we can see it again how there are uncertainties over time right scope changes um, uh, right you know you are based on the way you bid the entire project finances change and so you need some way of having flexible contracts you need some way of being able to anticipate these and say if there are scope changes ahead of time right. Uh, you can even put it in the model sort of tender documents that if there are scope changes these are the ways in which scope changes will be addressed and therefore uh, competing bidders can't complain against it CAG can't complain against it right everyone is part of the same uh, uh, sorry everyone is well aware of that information so certainly flexible contracts was key. So well but the whole notion of contractual flexibility is relatively new that is the whole point right does not matter it is not as if the west is doing it and we are not. Right, people just refuse to put in flexibility into the contracts because they are in, you know, they prefer having contracts that are bounded and you can very clearly say I have contracted this out, I have nothing more to do with this, okay. So the fact that they had foreign consultants which they did 
does not seem to have solved this problem. The contract was clearly not flexible, right? And flexibility would have greatly benefited the contract, even in terms of being able to say, look, extend the contract duration, right? Or whatever it is, whatever flexibility you want to put in, right? Probably needed to have been there, okay? What else? Huh? Okay. Okay, so maybe the designs could have been a bit more incomplete and this is actually a very interesting and relevant observation. See what happens and I think we might have talked about this earlier, uh, your gate sizes are in some ways controlled by the size of the aircraft, right. So depending on aircrafts of a certain size, you can have spacing between gates, right. If aircrafts become larger, then your gate spacing naturally has to become larger, right. Otherwise, how will you park aircraft side by side? Um, and aircrafts, you know, Boeing, others are manufacturing, Dreamliners, this, that, etc. Aircraft sizes are becoming a bit larger. So the question is, will the kinds of gates that you have and you built so many, right, be um, efficient as these sizes get larger and larger, right. And perhaps you need not have built out all of these gates, but could have built them later on, so that maybe you have a set of gates for the older aircraft and then as the newer aircraft come in, you actually have much, uh, you know, gates that are spaced much wider. So I think there is an element of incomplete design that could have come into this, right. I think the other thing that is, uh, uh, so the two other things is one is uh, the project shaping, they took a lot of time, but a lot of it was because of uh, the fact that they did not know, right. So they went back and forth, okay. What they did not probably do is, is sort of think through enough the way the bidding process would work, which is reflected in the fact that I have put in a large number of variables, 58 variables is quite a lot, right. I am not sure how to evaluate them, a committee comes in. So you often need to do mock runs of how these complex bidding processes would work before you actually turn them out to uh, for public tender, right. So I think and that probably was not done because while they spent a lot of time figuring out which mode of PPP, once they figured that out, they probably went a bit too fast to get it to tender. Right? But the other thing that I feel could have been added in was the whole stakeholder mapping element. What they have done is a really good job of mapping, mapping the stakeholders during construction, right. So they, they mapped out the stakeholders in construction, they identified who those people were and they have brought them to the table and they have created that committee, right. So whether they used power interest matrix or whatever, you know, we do not really know, but they have done a good job mapping those. But they have left out a lot of the non-construction stakeholders like the CAG, like ERA, etc who are now starting to create issues later on, right. So I think in terms of, you know, doing these kinds of facilitation committees, right, one possibility is that they should have tried to filter in a strategy for some of these other stakeholders as well and therefore the project stakeholder mapping probably needed to be a bit broader, yeah. Well, that is the whole point of stakeholders. So these are obvious stakeholders, right. So we know that CAG, CVC, you know, all of these people are, ERA is a, is a very obvious stakeholder. Right. So I think this is the skill of stakeholder mapping and I think all of these stakeholders are, you know, it is it, not a leap of faith to understand that this person is a stakeholder, they are right then and there, right. So if you can apply your mind and say, yes, the electricity department might not give me or the highways department may not give me a planning permission and therefore I need to uh, bring them in into a facilitation committee, right. Why aren't you thinking the same way about the ERA or about the CAG saying at some point based on transparency, these people are likely to audit my project and ask questions. Right. So, I am not saying bring them on because the whole point is CAG is arm's length away, that is what maintains the neutrality. But do you have a strategy where what you are doing is far more transparent so that they ask fewer questions, okay, is the this thing, okay. So these are essentially a list of, uh, you know, challenges that this case faced and potential ways in which they, some of some strategies were used, uh, NFC, earn value, etc. were used, but perhaps some of these kinds of strategies could have been used to make the Delhi airport story a lot better. Like it says in the case, the developer seems to not be making very much out of the airport, but seems to be making their money back out of the land uh, uh, transactions, right. But ideally, the airport should be able to run by itself, right, and that sort has not been facilitated, okay. Good. So let us uh, stop with the discussion on Delhi airport and go to the next case which is the Tirupur water supply and do a very similar analysis. Let us present the case and then let us talk through what the challenges were and what have we talked about in this class that can actually help, okay. So good, group 4, you guys are ready? Come.